Please lay the first section of my new ship. The largest ocean liner ever built is ready to take to the seas. Weighing 150,000 tons, she will reach speeds of 30 knots. Her generators could power a city the size of Southampton. The construction of the Queen Mary II has pushed the boundaries of technology as never before. This is the story of a legend in the making. A superliner for the 21st century. At $800 million, Queen Mary II is the most expensive liner ever built. She replaces the Queen Elizabeth II, or QE II, launched by Cunard in the 1960s. Renowned for her style and elegance, the QE II sailed the line from the UK to America for more than three decades. Most of today's cruise ships are pleasure boats, but Carnival, Cunard's parent company, decided that the Queen Mary II would be made of sterner stuff, ready to rule and ride the waves. When faced with rough weather, a cruise ship can only divert to the safety of a port. But a transatlantic liner, while providing the luxury of a cruise ship, must be capable of sailing through gale force winds and 30 meter waves. After arriving at her destination, the ship must turn around the same day and start her 5,000 kilometer Atlantic journey once again. When you think this huge ship is going to be crossing the North Atlantic for six days, totally isolated, it's very, I think, very nice for the passengers to be able to look out at the boiling sea around them in the comfort of their ship. But that comfort has a cost. For strength, a liner is constructed with steel, its hull twice the thickness of a cruise ship. Consequently, it costs almost twice as much. The liner required huge investment, but even in the age of jet travel, Carnival predicted the Queen Mary II would attract enough customers to ensure a profit in just over five years. In size, Queen Mary II is the equivalent of a ship and a half, covering an area of nearly one and a half hectares. To realize their dream, Carnival first needed a shipyard big enough to take on their superliner. There'd be vast amounts of materials involved, like the 300,000 steel sections weighing in at 52,000 tons. Could any shipyard cope? And there was another problem. In this industry, the shipyard finances most of the building costs up front, receiving only a 20% deposit until a liner is finished and formally accepted by its new owners. Could anyone afford to build the QM2? Alstom Chantier de l'Atlantique in Saint-Nazaire on the west coast of France, won the contract. It's one of the oldest and biggest shipyards in Europe. It was here that some of the greatest liners of the 20th century were built, notably the Normandy, considered by many the finest transatlantic liner ever constructed. The marine architect whose job it was to design the new queen was Stephen Payne, a man with a passion for the old ocean liners. The ship that really kindled my interest in passenger ships was the old Queen Elizabeth. And I often wondered as a young boy what a fantastic thing it would be to actually design and build a ship that would rival that great ship. In designing QM2, Stephen Payne drew much of his inspiration from the past. I have a personal philosophy that before you can do anything new, you've got to have a perception of what's happened uh, historically before, so that you know what's worked and what hasn't. Queen Mary II would use the best features of its predecessors, combined with the latest technology. But Stephen Payne would face some unique challenges. 150,000 tonnes of ship would need a powerful propulsion system to drive it through the water. But the QM2 would also need a tight turning circle and a good steering system to get it out of its dock. Stephen's design 
would have to surpass all the great ships of the past. Queen Mary II is the largest passenger liner ever built. At a length of 345 metres, she is longer than 36 London buses. The decision to build her entirely of steel was the main factor in determining her extreme size. The upper decks of QM2's predecessor, the Queen Elizabeth II, had been made of aluminium to reduce the weight of the superstructure as far as possible. But extra decks made of aluminium create other problems, including expensive maintenance as the aluminium ages. Ship's architect Stephen Payne faced the challenge of balancing the extra cost of a steel liner against the revenue from the number of passenger cabins. To make the sums add up, he'd have to think big. We very quickly determined that um, we just couldn't build anything smaller than QE2. It had to be at least her size, if not bigger. A million and a half dollars were spent on early model tests. 80,000 detailed plans were drawn up, and more than a million man-hours were spent bringing Stephen Payne's vision from the drawing board to the dry dock. On the 16th of January 2002, the first sheet of steel was cut. Materials from all over the world began arriving at the shipyard. Until the time of the QE2, traditional liners were constructed on an inclined slipway, built up from a keel with ribs and steel plating, until the form of the hull was complete. This was then dramatically launched into the water before the main outfitting was started. Modern methods of shipbuilding are very different, using prefabricated hull sections and cabins in order to keep the construction time and costs down. The master plan for Queen Mary II was divided into 42 zones, built from 94 separate blocks. Step by step, the ship was constructed from these vast modules, like a giant three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. Every week, 12,000 sheets of steel would arrive. In the shipyard's own workshops and sheds, this raw material was precision cut by a computer, rolled and curved, shaped with heat to follow computer-generated templates, and finally welded into the component parts of the hull and superstructure. By the 4th of July 2002, just six months after the first sheet of steel was cut, the first block was laid in the dock. The ceremony was presided over by her captain designate, Ronald Warwick. Captain Warwick would leave command of the QE2 to take on this role. So to the crane driver, I say this is Captain Warwick speaking. Please lay the first section of my new ship. Thank you. With a nod to maritime tradition, two coins, one French, one English, were placed in the keel. It's a custom dating back to the ancient Greeks who put gold coins in the bottom of a ship as an offering to Poseidon, god of the sea. The liner began to grow. Sections were constructed in the shipyard's sheds, then lifted, placed, and welded into position. The modular hull is made up of over 300,000 separate components. Holding all this together took nearly 1,500 kilometers of welding. 
At an early stage, the liner's principal power source, four diesel engines made in Finland, had to be installed. Each engine is 12 and a half meters long and weighs nearly 220 tons. Their size and weight mean they must be placed low down in the liner's hull. A process which had to begin while the hull was still under construction. The logistics involved in building the biggest ship in the world were mind-boggling. A handful of people had to shoulder the responsibility. Thousands of employees, materials, timetables and tests. Much of the coordination fell to the contract manager, Jean-Rémy Villageois. The final result must be uh, perfect. So uh, really the yard must do everything, the, their best effort to match uh, the, the, the delivery date, no matter what we have. So. It's a significant challenge. On the 1st of December 2002, the partly completed hull of Queen Mary II was floated gently down to the river end of the dock. This way, the QM2 could grow without holding up the rest of the yard's production line. The enormous bulb, or bulbous bow, to be positioned at the prow of the liner beneath the water, was manufactured in Gdansk, in Poland. The bulb was designed to improve hydrodynamic efficiency by eliminating the bow wave the liner would create when moving through the water. The liner's massive bow structure with its distinctive elegant flare towers more than 30 meters above the waterline. The Queen Mary II, I've tried to take elements from all other successful ships, elements that I've felt really would work well combined into one great liner. If you take the bow of the ship, it's actually based on that on the QE2 where she was crossing the Atlantic for over 30 years without major damage. It seemed logical to repeat that. And atop that, I've put the breakwater of the Normandy that was very efficient in dispersing any seas that went on the, the folks or in rough weather. Queen Mary II's navigation bridge, or wheelhouse, is huge. At almost 50 meters wide, it was designed to house her up-to-the-minute integrated computer systems. The bridge was inspired by the QE2. But where she has open bridge wings, those of the Queen Mary II are fully enclosed to protect the sensitive electronic navigation equipment. Another colossal component, the liner's signature red and black funnel. That's a very important feature of the ship, and it really is the first thing you focus on when you, when you look at a passenger liner. But it also has to be extremely functional. It's there to disperse the smoke and to ensure that no smuts or gases fall on the surrounding decks. And it was a real challenge to develop a funnel within the height restrictions we have. In New York, the buildings may be skyscrapers, but the bridges don't leave much room for manoeuvre. QE2, when she enters New York Harbour, she has 12 metres clearance to get under the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. Queen Mary 2 is so much higher that even with this funnel, they will only have two metres clearance. And the real problem we had was to develop this funnel in such a way that the smoke would disperse from the top of it without going on the aft end of the ship. And we achieved that by optimizing the shape of this scoop. And when we first tested the funnel without the modified scoop, it didn't work particularly well. But optimizing the funnel in the wind tunnel and making the scoop work as it should 
we now have a very good funnel, especially considering the height. With only two meters clearance, the world would be holding its breath when the Queen Mary II sailed into New York and under the bridge for the very first time. The shape of the ship is classical because when you look at it from the side, it's like a pyramid. The funnel is in the middle of the ship, and that's where the heaviest part of the ship is, where the engines are. But the forward end and the aft end needs to be lighter, and that's why you have the, the pyramid shape, where there's not much right at the front of the ship, not much at the back. And the whole thing is just completely different to the box that you see as a modern-day cruise ship. Thanks to her modular structure, the ship was quickly built. Just 13 months after the first sheet of steel was cut, exterior construction was nearing completion, and Queen Mary II was almost ready to sound her horn. She would be moving from the dry dock to dock C to be fitted out. This dock had lain empty since the last supertankers were built here in the 1970s. But because of Queen Mary II's size, it was the only place she'd fit. Preparing the dock took several months of work, clearing it out and laying the blocks that would be used to support the liner. Underneath these blocks, there were two meters of reinforced concrete. The concrete, together with the metal beams and their top cushion of wood, would provide support for the gigantic liner. There were still 22 beams left to finish dressing because each one required a wooden sleeper, which needed measuring. We have already leveled the beams, and all that is left to do is the wood, which has been measured and is being cut at the steelworks. The support bed was designed to follow the contours of the bottom of the liner to within a tolerance of one centimeter. The wooden sleepers would compress to accommodate any variations as the liner got heavier with each new fitting. So one beam like this supports 300 tons, and those that are at the stern of the ship, because it is the heaviest, they can support 600 tons. This was a new procedure for the shipyard, and one made ready in just the nick of time. On the day of the float out, the hull would be guided precisely onto her new supports by laser. In the past, the launch of an ocean liner was a very tense and dramatic moment. If the calculations were wrong, she could either come to a halt on the slipway or slide out of control down to the water. In 1934, the launch of the first Queen Mary went relatively smoothly with over 2,000 tons of drag chains slowing her down. But when her great rival, the French liner Normandy, was launched two years earlier, things had been rather more spectacular. The shipyard had used tons of lard to grease the slipway, and this, combined with what is thought to have been a miscalculation of the amount of drag chains needed, meant that the great ship literally raced into the river at over 30 kilometers an hour, causing a wave that drenched hundreds of spectators. Even in the 21st century, the float-out of the biggest liner in the world is not without risk. Queen Mary II's size meant that any mishandling could have meant disaster. Nine meters of water would be needed to move her to the new dock. The water was deep enough, but there were rocks underneath. The bottom of her hull would have only one meter of clearance. Jean Thomas is one of the pilots who had the job of maneuvering Queen Mary II out of dock B and into dock C. So you can see on the plan, the color shows the depth. So if you do a quick calculation, you can see that with 8 meters draft, plus 1 meter spare, so we need 9 meters depth. The height of the tide being 6 meters, the boat must avoid the areas of the river where the water is less than 3 meters at low tide. 
So in effect, the ship must make her transfer without going into the parts colored yellow, brown, etc. She has to stay in the green. Helen Pellerey is another member of the pilot team. There are huge technical risks. Firstly, that she doesn't run aground. That her draft isn't what we thought. So she's heavier. And will she adapt to her new position? There is a certain amount of improvisation. You have to keep your fingers crossed, but uh, so far, so good. The pilots would also be pitting their experience against the vagaries of the tidal currents and the weather. The most risky element was the wind. If it caught the vast profile of the liner like a sail, it might drive her into shallow water. If the visibility wasn't good, the whole operation would have to be cancelled and rescheduled. March the 21st, 2003. The night of the float out. Queen Mary II had no propellers fitted, so the whole manoeuvre relied on a flotilla of eight tugs to pull the great liner along. Though the hull of Queen Mary II was complete, at this stage, she was nothing but a giant empty shell. As dawn broke, Queen Mary II was successfully positioned into Dock C. Now, her fitting out could begin. The construction of the Queen Mary II entered a new phase. Fitting out the superliner would require thousands of workers from all over the world, all with different skills. Among the many nations working together on the ship, 350 Indian craftsmen subcontracted to install the air conditioning. In India TV channel, we will see with our family that Queen Mary is passing from any country. I can proudly speak to my children, look at son, this is Queen Mary. I will do work in this Queen Mary one year. Hello, I'm Sophie. I sell coffee on the boat. Celine works as a welder on the liner. I can proudly say in 20 or 30 years to my children and grandchildren, I worked on that amazing boat because I believe it's a legend. But it's hard work making history. The multinational team had only nine months to complete a liner that would house more than two and a half thousand passengers and over a thousand crew. They were building a floating city. But with fares for the transatlantic voyage ranging from $1,500 to $30,000, it's a luxury that few of the workers could ever hope to enjoy. At any one time, up to 4,500 people were working on the liner, hundreds of different technical trades. The electricians had to fit thousands of kilometers of electrical cable into the body of the liner. For fire safety reasons, the owners had specified that the main cables running through the liner must be installed unbroken for their 300 meter length. A team of men had to pull this heavy cable through the twists and turns of the overhead ducting. Woven in amongst the electrical cables and wiring, the pipes carrying the various heating systems air conditioning and water systems, sound and vibration insulation. The numerous public rooms, passenger cabins and deck areas had to be constructed and fitted out. Decorative plaster mouldings were made for the formal restaurants and theatres. Commissioned artworks were designed and produced. Every day, hundreds of new components arrived at the shipyard, ready to be fitted. 
a logistical nightmare unless the planning was perfect. Innovative technical features also had to be installed. Queen Mary II would be the first ever passenger liner to be pulled and steered through the water by four pods. Huge electric propulsion units suspended below the stern. These pods are the largest and most powerful ever made. At 350 tons fully equipped, each one of the four pods weighs more than a fully laden jumbo jet. When the first Queen Mary was built, her ship's propellers weighed only 35 tons each. As the designs for the pods were developed, constant testing was carried out. The propulsion tests looked positive, but when the pressure pulses were tested, they proved disappointing. What we're doing there, we're measuring the impact pressures on the hull caused as the propellers rotate. And if you have very high pressure pulses, it means that you're going to have very bad vibrations. The measured levels were over three times the specified limit. So we redesign the pods, move them to a different position in order to have a bigger clearance from the propellers to the hull. The arrival of the pods and their transportation from the saint Nazaire docks to the shipyard gave the local people a glimpse of the enormous equipment needed for the Queen Mary II. All the pods have four bladed stainless steel propellers. Each blade bolted into position so they can be replaced individually if damaged. The two rear pods are azimuthing, steering the liner as well as providing propulsion, in much the same way as an outboard motor does for a small boat. The remaining two would be fixed forward and would only provide propulsion. Because of their size, Getting these propellers into position under the liner was a feat of precision engineering in itself. For the French shipyard, this was a symbolic moment. The liner now had her own power to move through the water. One of the great benefits of pod propulsion, a reduction in vibration caused by the engines. In the old days, the propeller shaft from the engines created a constant source of vibration and noise in the hull of the ship. This greatly affected the comfort of passengers on the classic liners. On Queen Mary II, the specification regarding levels of vibration was strictly laid out. And during construction, a team was dedicated to the measuring and elimination of noise and vibration. Housed just under the waterline in three meter diameter tunnels, the propellers of the bow thruster units. These electronically powered thrusters enable Queen Mary II to maneuver sideways, either when holding a position at sea or when docking. At 3.2 megawatts, these are the most powerful in the world, and Queen Mary II has three of them. Another technical first. Two is the greatest number used on a passenger liner until now. But early design tests on the bow thruster openings showed that they increased drag by nearly 3%. Thruster doors would be needed to help eliminate this drawback. Pivoting circular doors, similar to those used on Queen Elizabeth II, but much larger, were chosen. Another component directly affecting the comfort of the passengers, the stabilizers. The QM2 stabilizers, made in Scotland, would have an important job to do. Keeping the ship steady in the rough seas and storms of the North Atlantic. It's usual for a ship to have two stabilizers, but on the QM2, they would install four, each weighing a massive 70 tons. 
The stabilizer fins were designed to extend more than six meters beyond the liner's sides and react automatically to her roll. Inside there's a roll sensor to know at every moment what's the roll of the ship. And the sensor processes this information to give instruction to the fins how to tilt, at what speed, what angle. The aim? Stabilizers that would react within seconds and reduce the liner's roll by a projected 90%. But would all these things actually work when they were put to the test? There could be no practice runs with a liner like Queen Mary II. There were no prototypes to test. The first time they would know if their big idea would float, her initial sea trial, just 12 weeks before her final delivery date. Before the sea trials, key parts of the life-saving system had to be tested. The lifeboats, each holding 150 passengers, were positioned higher than on a cruise ship, on deck seven, more than 30 meters above the water. The new rules and regulations for passenger ships say that the lifeboats must be much lower down in the ship. My argument was, have a look at what happens on QE2. And QE2 in the last 10 years has experienced waves of over 100 feet high. And they have found on occasion that some of the lifeboats have been damaged. And you, you need your lifeboats. They're there to save you if something really goes wrong. And we spoke with the authorities, and they all agreed, yes, you, you can put the lifeboats up high if you've got a special reason. And everybody said the North Atlantic is the special reason. Carrying weight corresponding to a fully laden lifeboat each pair of davits, or hoists, was tested for the correct rate of fall. If it was too fast, the passengers could be injured, or the boat damaged when it hit the water. One of the most important elements of the whole build, the paint job that would protect every square centimetre of the liner's steel structure. The Queen Mary II's contract specifies a 40-year fatigue life. She shouldn't require any major maintenance for nearly half a century. The person in charge of all exterior anti-corrosion painting, Tanya Martin. Of course, it's a very complete system of paint that we have to apply more. Uh, complex than on other ships, more coats of paint because uh, the owner can't tolerate rust to appear while the cruise is on. And on top of that, really wants a very good quality of details. It must be perfect. Well, in most parts of the ship, there's an average of two or three coats. And only in uh, the main structural tanks, we've uh, applied a one coat system. We don't want it to be too thick because if it becomes too thick, it will eventually crack and fall off under its own weight. So there, there is an optimum thickness. Throughout the liner, each day 200 painters set to work. But the conditions had to be just right. No exterior painting could be done in the rain or in the damp of the early morning or evening. The steel had to be treated first with an anti-corrosive paint to combat the rigors of seawater and damp, salty air. In some areas, up to seven coats were applied. In total, 550,000 square meters had to be covered. 400 tons of French-made paint. It's a gauge. It's called a cone. It's used to measure the thickness of the paint which has been put on. Areas such as the liner's flat bottom, which alone accounted for 8,000 square meters, had to be meticulously painted in time for the first sea trials. It had to be as smooth as possible, because any roughness would create drag on the ship as she moved through the water. More drag would mean loss of speed, up to half a knot, plus additional fuel costs. And from the bottom to the top of the liner, the paint had to withstand extreme temperatures and weather conditions. The decks will reach 50 degrees centigrade when she's under the hot sun. She will also face 
the ravages of the North Atlantic where the, sh the waves will stress the ship's structure, twisting and bending the ship so all of the coatings that we apply have to be able to um, withstand those kind of conditions. The exterior finish under Tanya's supervision could be seen progressing each day. But down in the bowels, below the waterline, was another world. Here, the paint finish was equally important, but hidden from view. Reachable only through small, sealable hatches. Here, teams of painters crawled in the darkness through the empty fuel and water tanks and structural compartments, coating behind every bulkhead and into every awkward corner, protecting the hull from the corrosion that could eat the steel away from the inside. You're always in night. That's the world of the tank painters. It's the night, it's not the day, it's never the day. We are now here in the 5005th dry tank of the ship, one of the biggest, under the principal engines. The total surface area of the bodywork is a little more than 6,000 square meters. Painting the liner began in March and continued right up until delivery. The Queen Mary II was designed to be the first green passenger ship afloat. Her environmentally friendly zero discharge philosophy was an ambitious challenge for the team. On board the ship we've got 4,400 people, which is a small town and now in every town they're producing wastewater and solid wastes, food wastes. We are not allowed to dump that in the sea. Basically the main, main systems are three, yes. We've got the drinking water, which is used for drink, drink of course, but also showers and all the uh, usual use. This is one system, hot and cold. Then we've got the uh, gray, what so-called grey water system, which is uh, water from galleys and showers and basins, etc., which must not be polluted by water from toilets, which is a third system. So it's three completely different systems which has clearly separated and never be connected. Waste water would be purified in a bioreactor back to drinking water standard and used for deck washing and laundry. The months moved on. Now the liner was only 10 weeks away from its crucial first sea trials at the end of September. Work was progressing steadily on all fronts. Day after day, from first light and in any weather, thousands of skilled workers, managers, engineers and fitters carried out their jobs. In the steel carcass of the ship, the noise of drilling, cutting and grinding was deafening, and things didn't always go according to plan. The installation of the air conditioning was falling behind schedule. This enormous task entailed fitting ducting for hot and cold air throughout the ship. 60 kilometers of pipe in all. It weighed 800 tons and would take half a million man-hours of work. From the first weeks, the gap between the deadline and the day's work had been growing. Now there had to be a fear that the Queen Mary II would not be finished on time. Eight weeks from delivery, the Queen Mary II was still docked in her French shipyard. She had yet to be tested in open seas. As the water, electrical and air conditioning services were completed in the passenger areas, the cabin modules were installed. All summer they had been arriving complete from the factory and were literally wheeled into place. The passenger cabins were then finished by an army of carpenters, electricians, plumbers, carpet fitters and painters, and then checked by construction inspector David Barter. His work would carry on right up to the formal handover of the ship in December. Okay. 
I think it's 2017, the total altogether. Twice, so it's 4,034, I think, inspections. So it works out, I think, about 50 cabins every day from now until delivery day. The decorative finishes had to be inspected and fittings checked. Light switches, taps, shelves, cupboard drawers, every last detail. Now, make sure that all these, these are fixed and this one is not. So, there you go. The cabins are fine. I mean, I'm really very impressed, to tell you the truth. Sometimes I think the delivery time gets closer and closer and people under pressure make mistakes. If satisfactory, the work was signed off as finished and the cabin sealed until yeah. the handover. Yeah, then check and you have to... OK, next. This one. This one. A modern cruise ship is designed from the inside out, a floating hotel, then encased within a ship. But the Queen Mary II was conceived first and foremost as a transatlantic liner. She was to be structure-led, with her interior architects working within the requirements of the marine engineers. We made this deal when we first started working on the project that I, as the naval architect, would look after the exterior of the ship. But I said to Andy, you leave that alone and you can do the interiors, obviously, and I won't get involved in any shape or form except for the structure, which is very important for this ship. The, uh, the block planning of the ship, where the big spaces were going to be, was pretty much developed by Stephen and his team. Um, but uh, we were able to manipulate the actual layouts within those block spaces. We also did help, I think, to uh, instigate some of the flow movements within the ship to be able to give Stephen the benefit of our experience in terms of moving passengers through ships. The original design brief stipulated a transatlantic liner of modern form that would echo the style and grandeur of the classic liners of the 1930s the golden era of transatlantic travel. One such grand design is the Britannia restaurant, named after Cunard's first vessel of 1840. This room stretches the full 42 meters width of the liner and is topped with a domed glass ceiling. It's one of the largest public spaces on any ship afloat and will seat over 1,300 diners. As passengers move through the public spaces, they will be constantly reminded of the ocean. There are more than 2,500 windows in the hull and superstructure, rooms with a sea view. A lot of modern day cruise ships try to be hotels where they try to have the people looking inwards. And it's certainly my intention with this ship that people would be able to look out and be at home on the sea. One of the places passengers will be able to experience the sea air firsthand is deck seven the promenade deck. At this level, over 30 meters above the swell, they can stroll or jog around the perimeter of the liner. At the sides, below the lifeboats and at the stern with its swimming pools and bars, the deck is open to the elements. But at the bridge front, the walkway space is covered to protect against the Atlantic conditions. The shape at the front of the ship is based on the shape from the original Queen Mary. And she had a lot of open galleries where people could look out over the front out to sea. But on a transatlantic run, there's so much wind, it's very difficult for people to stand there and to look out over the sea. So what I did, I took the basic shape and we've plated it in. And in plating it in, you get this marvellous front that is unique on a modern ship. The end of August. Less than four weeks to go before the ship's big test. The first sea trials. In five short months since her successful float out, she had almost made the transition from giant hull to an ocean-going liner. Much of the exterior paintwork was completed and the interior fittings and installation of pipework and cabling was almost on schedule. But in every quarter, it was still a race against the clock. In the hot and uncomfortable atmosphere of the main engine room, deep in the basement of the liner, the four huge diesel engines were being tested, and there were teething problems. Prior to running diesel number four, the engineers had one final check of the oil levels and bearings. Okay. 
and then they were all set. This is only a small piece and a milestone. But the engine was reluctant to start first time. A problem with the air intake. I need air to start the engine. Then she was away. I'm not alone. <clears throat> we are a team. For sure. So the team feels proud to start up this boat. Now the Queen Mary II floated expectantly in Dock C at the Chantier shipyard. She faced her biggest challenge to date, her first sea trials. How would her state-of-the-art technology perform? Four huge electric pods, three bow thrusters and complex computer systems combined in one gigantic liner. A world first. A lot of hard work, a lot of planning, and a huge investment. Now, only one question remained. Could the Queen Mary II really rule the waves? The story continues as the great ship prepares to sail. Five duplexes, four deluxe penthouses, six grand penthouses. You've seen the glorious standard to which they're being built. Relish the luxury of the Queen Mary II again after the break. And engineering genius celebrated in our marvels of modern engineering weekend here on Discovery Knowledge. The Hoover.